Just before I call the Secretary of State, I think there is disappointment. It's just been raised with the opposition. The statement wasn't provided in time. The statement wasn't provided to my office in time. I know we want to set off on the right way, and I'm sure the officials will make note when they arrive that we really do to make sure. The fact is, it's seven minutes past, four minutes past, it's meant to be four minutes, and I'm sure the Secretary of State will want to ensure it never happens again. Right, Secretary of State. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. With permission, I would like to make a statement about the Government's mission to make Britain a clean energy superpower. This Government was elected two weeks ago. Since then, we have lifted the onshore wind ban in England, in place since 2015, consented more than 1.3 gigawatts of solar projects, powering the equivalent of almost 400,000 homes, established the 2030 Mission Control Centre in my department under Chris Stark to plan and deliver our mission, and the Chancellor has established a national wealth fund to create good, clean energy jobs across our country. And, Mr Speaker, we are just getting started. And, and, and the reason we're moving at this pace is for one overriding reason, because of the urgency of the challenges we face. The challenge of our energy insecurity, laid bare by Putin's invasion of Ukraine and paid for by the British people in the worst cost of living crisis in generations. The challenge of an economy that doesn't work for working people, with too few good jobs at decent wages, and the challenge of the climate crisis, not a future threat but a present reality. This Government, Mr Speaker, has a driving philosophy. Homegrown clean energy can help us tackle all of these challenges, including, crucially, energy security. And today, Mr Speaker, the Climate Change Committee publishes their progress report to Parliament. I want to thank the Interim Chair, Piers Forster, and the Interim Chief Executive, James Richardson, for their excellent work. The Committee say in their report, British-based renewable energy is the cheapest and fastest way to reduce vulnerability to volatile global fossil fuel markets. The faster we get off fossil fuels, the more secure we become. Mr Speaker, they are right. That is why making Britain a clean energy superpower is one of the five missions of this Government, delivering clean power by 2030 and accelerating to net zero across the economy. Today, the Committee's report also lays bare the truth about the last Government. Despite achievements I am happy to acknowledge, it is coruscating about the lurch of recent years. It says, and I quote, last year the previous Government signalled a slowing of pace and reversed or delayed key policies. And it goes on. The announcements were given with the justification they will make the transition more affordable for people, but with no evidence backing this claim. And it concludes, and I quote again, the country is not on track to hit our 2030 international target of 68 per cent emissions reductions. Indeed, they say our assessment is that only a third of the emissions reductions required are currently covered by credible plans. Mr Speaker, this is our inheritance for a target to be achieved in just five years' time. I will respond formally to the Committee in the autumn, and as part of that I have asked my Department to provide me with a thorough analysis of their findings. But I can tell the House today we will hold fast to our 2030 Clean Power Mission and our NDC because it is the right thing to do for our country. And today I set out our next steps. First, onshore wind is one of the cheapest sources of power we have. To those in the House who claimed they were protecting communities with the onshore wind ban, let us be clear. They have undermined our energy security and set back the fight against the climate crisis. That is why, in the first 72 hours of this Government, we lifted the ban, which I today confirm formally to the House. But under the onshore wind ban, the pipeline of projects in England shrank by 90 per cent. Over a year ago, the last Government's net zero czar, Chris Skidmore, who I pay tribute to, made a recommendation of an onshore wind task force to drive forward projects. The last government ignored it. We will implement it. The task force will work with developers to rebuild the pipeline of projects. Second, solar power, among the cheapest forms of power we have. My right honourable friend, the Deputy Prime Minister, and I are determined we have a rooftop revolution. We must use the rooftops of our country for solar far better than we do at the moment. That is why the Deputy Prime Minister and I are clear that rooftop solar should play an important role, where appropriate, as part of the future standards for homes and buildings. And the solar roadmap we have been waiting for it for 18 months will be published soon with greater ambition, and I have reconvened the Solar Task Force to deliver this objective. Mr Speaker, 
As we face up to the challenge of the energy transition, we must also plan for how we use land in this country to ensure a proper balance between food security, nature preservation and clean energy. After dither and delay under the previous government, the DEFRA Secretary will publish a land use framework working in tandem with our spatial energy plan. I can also assure the House that communities will continue to have a say on any proposals in their area. And it is important for this government, and it is important for this government that where communities host clean energy infrastructure, they should directly benefit from it. But we will not carry on with a position where the clean energy we need doesn't get built and the British people pay the price. Credible external estimates suggest that ground-mounted solar used just 0.1% of our land in 2022. The biggest threat, Mr Speaker, to nature and food security and to our rural communities is not solar panels or onshore wind. It is the climate crisis, which threatens our best farmland, food production and the livelihoods of farmers. This Government is not going to proceed on the basis of myth and false information, but evidence. Every time the previous Government ducked, delayed and denied the difficult decisions needed for clean energy, it made us less secure, raise bills and undermine climate action. Mr Speaker, no more. Third, offshore wind will be the backbone of our clean energy mission. Allocation round five was a catastrophe for the industry, overseen by the last Government, with no offshore wind contracts awarded. The upcoming round is a critical test. We will get this crucial industry back on its feet. And, for the big, and by the beginning of August, I will report back on the budget for AR6 to ensure that as much clean homegrown energy as possible gets built while ensuring value for money. Our fourth step is the Great British Energy Bill announced in the, in the Gracious Speech. I am extremely proud that this is the first bill for decades that will enable us to establish a UK-wide publicly owned energy generation company. Mr Speaker, the truth is there is already widespread public ownership of energy in Britain, but by foreign governments. We have offshore wind farms in the UK, owned by the governments of Denmark, France, Norway and Sweden through state-owned companies. These governments know a publicly owned national champion is part of a modern industrial strategy and generates a return for taxpayers, crowding in, not crowding out, private investment. For too long, Britain has opted out and lost out. Today, we say no more. Great British Energy, headquartered in Scotland, will invest in homegrown clean energy to increase our energy independence, create good jobs with strong trade unions and tackle the climate crisis. Investing in technologies such as nuclear, offshore wind, tidal hydrogen and carbon capture and ensuring a just transition for our oil and gas communities. GB Energy will also oversee the biggest expansion of community energy in British history through our local power plan. Mr Speaker, we on this side believe in the ownership of British assets, of British assets, by the British people, for the benefit of the British people. And I hope, following the people's verdict at the general election, this is a patriotic mission that the whole House can get behind. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I've seen 19 years of debate on climate and energy in this House. The clean energy transition represents the biggest transformation of our economy for 200 years, and it is massively challenging. We have been at our, at our best as a country and as a House when we have worked together for the sake of the national interest. I pay tribute to people of all parties who have been champions of this agenda over the last 14 years. Baroness May, who legislated for Net Zero, the Right Honourable Member for Kingston and Surbiton, who oversaw the growth of offshore wind, Caroline Lucas, and on my side, my friend Alan Whitehead. One of my, er one of my early decisions was to re-establish the role of the Secretary of State as the lead climate negotiator in my department, because we can only protect future generations with strong action at home and leadership abroad. Next week, I'll be hosting the President of this year's COP, COP29 in Azerbaijan in London. He will be joined by the presidencies of COP28 and COP30. I have invited the President of COP26, Lord Sharma, who presided with such distinction, to join our discussions. Mr Speaker, this is a sign of how I intend to go on, working with all, people of all parties and none in this national endeavour. That is what the British people have a right to expect of us. As the Prime Minister rightly says, country first, party second. It is more true on this issue than any other. This Government will act at pace and work with anyone who shares our mission. And I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. Shadow Secretary of State, Clerk Lecotinio. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker.
Baker, and I would just like to put on record my disappointment not to get the statement in good time. Yeah, yeah. And I know the right honourable gentleman will want to uh, provide us with the same courtesy that we tried to provide them when we were in government. But that being said, I would like to congratulate him on his return to government. I was sad not to see more of him during the election campaign, particularly because our ability to secure enough cheap energy will be crucial to this nation's success in the decades ahead. I'd like to also put on record my thanks to the officials who he will now work with, and I do wish him well in his endeavour. But energy will be this government's big test. They talk a good game on growth, but the Secretary of State's energy policy is their greatest liability. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. In government, we had built more offshore wind than any other country bar China. We set out the largest expansion of nuclear power in 70 years. Yeah, and we had yeah. said that, yes, we will need oil and gas in the decades ahead, as the Climate Change Committee indeed has said, and we should use British oil and gas where needed. Because we are in a global race for energy, and demand will be higher in the years ahead because of data and AI. And if his plans to set out to decarbonise the grid by 2030 are in place, we need to know what those plans will do to people's energy bills, to our energy security, mm -hmm. and to our reliance on the current dominant player for cables, for batteries, for critical minerals, which is China. Mm -hmm. And he is very happy to quote the Climate Committee, but they also acknowledge that we will need oil and gas well into 2050, and so the questions that he must answer is where he would like that to come from. And actually, when it comes to other quotes, he should, I think, consider some of the other members of business who have commented on his policy, whether that's the chief executive of Mitsubishi mm -hmm. Power, who said that his plans would require a huge sacrifice by the country, citing the costs of the Secretary of State's approach. The chief executive of INEOS said his approach to energy was absurd, leaving us dependent on independent uh, on imports of foreign fuels with higher emissions, doing nothing for the climate. Even the GMB said that his plans were unviable and would lead to power cuts and blackouts yep. and enormous costs. Yeah. And actually, yeah. Unite has said their plans yeah. for the North Sea yeah. would turn yeah. oil and gas workers yeah. into the coal miners yeah. of their generation. So what the honourable gentleman, I think, must answer is why he would like to import gas with much higher emissions, yep. how many jobs will be lost from his plans, yep. how much investment will be lost into the new technologies of the future, like hydrogen, like carbon, like offshore wind, and will he meet with those workers and explain to them what will happen to their livelihoods? Mm. In the, in, in the election, he claimed that he would lower bills, that he would save families £300. However, those numbers are already in the savings, and there was no one on his side who could set out what the cost of his plans to decarbonise the grid by 2030 are. Who will pay for those network costs? What will this do to people's standing charges, which were already too high? And he's also, I think, commented about having a, a say in terms of communities, that energy infrastructure that he will need and the, the fact that he wants to go further and faster, that will have a huge impact on rural communities. Their concerns must be addressed. Yep. And as I set out, the plans for our energy cannot come at the expense of our food or national security. So he has accused me, I think, of dither, he said in his statement. But as he will know from his officials, in at least one of those cases that he has signed off, I'd already instructed some time ago that I was minded to reject and that paperwork was yep. being prepared. Yep. So he must set out urgently Why? what his criteria will be, because he has overturned, in one case, an expert examining authority. In another case, he has signed off a solar farm, which will be 40% on our best and most versatile agricultural land. Did he know this was the case? And if so, what was his basis for finding that acceptable? Will he continue our efforts to build more solar on rooftops? I think he mentioned he would re reconvene the solar task force. I hate to tell him, but it had never been disbanded. And we were due to publish that work. And so I would like to know at what date he will be able to publish that work. And so in conclusion, the Secretary of State's party won the election and they promised change. But he was not on show during that campaign not to once. answer these critical questions of how he was going to provide that change and what it will mean for the country. What will his plans mean for the price of electricity? What will they mean for our ability to keep the lights on? What will they mean for struggling families' bills, for our economy, for the livelihoods of oil and gas workers? What will they mean for our reliance on China? For all that the Labour government talk about growth, they will not be able to deliver on that with the Secretary of State's plans for energy. So I 
do hope in the months ahead he will set out some of this detail to be examined. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Mr Speaker, can I start by congratulating the Right Honourable Lady on her recent engagement? Uh, and I want to wish her and her fiancé all the best for the future. We may disagree on some issues, but I believe this Government and the Right Honourable Lady can at least share a belief in long honeymoons. Uh, uh, and on, on, her, on her response, I have to say to her, I, I was disappointed, because the lines were very, very familiar. That's because they were the lines she's used for the last year. And here she comes today to the House, and she repeats the, the, the lines as if the intervening meteorite has not hit the Conservative Party. <laughs> the worst election result in 200 years for her party. And, and the truth is that, as sensible Conservatives know, the lurch that she worked on with the former Prime Minister, the Leader of the Opposition, a year ago, was an electoral disaster for the Conservative Party. The lurch away from climate action. And so what you saw in her statement is this classic dilemma for the Conservative Party. And we will see this played out, I hope, many long years of opposition. The dilemma on the one hand, do they go the reform route? Do they, do they go the reform route to be climate deniers or do they actually re-embrace climate? Order. Order. Can I just say I don't need any advice what it is. I'll decide whether it's a question, it's an answer actually. Now, on, on, the points that, on the points that she made, look, first of all, there's a fundamental issue here, which is unless we drive for clean energy, and this is what the Climate Change Committee said, and I really would strongly recommend honourable and right members read this, unless we drive for clean energy, we will end up energy insecure, which is why we had the worst cost of living crisis in generations in our country, because of our exposure to fossil fuels, both domestically, frankly, and internationally, set and sold on the world market, uh, and we will end up paying more for energy. Now, the truth is you wouldn't know it. The House wouldn't know it from what she said about our 2030 target. She had a target when she was in government for 95% clean power by 2030. Of course, of course, targets didn't matter for the last government because they were always miles away from reaching them. On the question of the North Sea, on the question of the North Sea, we set out our manifesto position, which is not to issue licences to explore new fields, but to keep existing fields for their lifetime. But here is the truth, the, the conversation we've, we've got to have. The, the fate of North Sea oil and gas communities is defined by do we drive forward in the clean energy of the future? Do we have a plan for carbon capture and storage? Do we have a plan for hydrogen? Do we have a plan for offshore wind? They had none of those things. So we're not going to take any lectures from the party opposite on just transitions, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker. She had other lines which were a rehearsal of, of the election. I'd just say to her on this solar question, she refers to one particular planning decision. I, I do think the, lady, the Honourable Lady has lady, got a, a degree of uh, brass neck because she criticised me for overturning the planning authority. And I'm in a quasi-judicial role, so I'll be careful what I say. She had this on her in her department for a year. She could, have, she, could have, she could have agreed with the planning authority and rejected the application, but she chose not to do so. That is, that is the reality. Mr Speaker, Mr. Mr. Speaker I, I just end on, I just end on, uh, on, on, this, on this point. Uh, in my experience, when you lose a general election, a period of reflection is in order. And I do say to the Conservative Party, they need to reflect long and hard about the signals they sent in this election. Their climate lurch was a disaster, a disaster for them electorally, but much more importantly to me, a disaster for the country. Under this government, Mr Speaker, Britain is back open for business and climate leadership. Bill Esterson. Well, thank you very much, and uh, it's great to see you back in the chair, Mr Speaker. It's also great to see the Secretary of State at the dispatch box on this side of the House again. I very much welcome what he said about the jobs, about the lower bills, about the energy security and about the climate action that are at the heart of this Government's plans. This is very much true in the Liverpool City region 
where, as he said, offshore wind is going to play such an important, increasing role in our energy future, along with onshore wind, solar, hydrogen, carbon capture, nuclear. But in the case of the Liverpool City region, can I just ask him this? We have exciting plans for tidal energy, and I hope that he can confirm that tidal energy will form a part of what he wants to see through the plans that he is setting forward. Well, I thank my honourable friend for that question, and he has been over a long period an eloquent advocate for the role that business can play in generating the clean energy of of our future and and generating uh, prosperity. I can absolutely confirm uh, that you know, we want to embrace the widest range of technologies. Obviously, we have to make sure it's value for money. But you know, what I always say on these occasions is the climate crisis and, and the energy security challenge is so big for us as a country that we have to embrace every form of technology at our disposal. That is the only way we'll succeed. Can I just gently say this will finish at one o'clock so we can help each other along the way. But first of all, I'm going to take the Lib Dem spokesperson. We're a hobbits. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and may I welcome the new Secretary of State to his place. I share his passion for climate action, but may I also say uh, next time we need his statement in better time than today. No doubt the best route to affordable energy is renewables. Under the former government, renewable projects have faced long delays and costs have skyrocketed. Indeed, the previous uh, government's record um, on renewables was absolutely miserable. By 2050, our electricity demand is expected to double, and we must make upgrading our grid infrastructure a big priority. The Government will know that one of the biggest challenges will be to bring communities behind hosting the big infrastructure changes needed for the grid expansion and cope with the huge landscape transformation. How will the Government actually achieve to get that public consent? To achieve our legally binding targets, we also need a rooftop solar revolution, as he has already mentioned. This includes introducing stronger incentives for households to install solar panels and ensure a fair price for energy that they sell back to the grid. Will the government work with the Liberal Democrats on these strong incentives for households to um, install solar pan- panels? Uh, Mr. Mrs. Deputy Speaker, Madam Deputy Speaker, we, will, um, we Liberal Democrats acknowledge the new approach taken by this new government, and I look forward to working constructively with the Secretary of State to achieve our very ambitious targets. Secretary of State. Uh, well, can I welcome the uh, Honourable Lady's question? And uh, we worked together when uh, we were in opposition on, on these uh, issues. Can I welcome you, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, as well uh, to the Chair? Let me do with, deal with the two substantive points uh, that she uh, makes. Look, on the first question of public consent, this is absolutely something that we need to do. Uh, and, and I see it in sort of three ways. One, uh, communities need a say. Two, communities need benefit. When, you know, the, communities are providing a service to the country when they host clean energy infrastructure, and therefore there needs to be benefit for those communities. But thirdly, this is a debate we're going to have to have, and I'm afraid the last government didn't grasp, grasp the nettle on this. We, we are going through a massive change in our economy. And the question is, if we don't build, for example, the grid, if we don't roll out solar, we are going to be poorer as a country. We're going to, we are absolutely exposing ourselves to future cost of living crises. So I will look forward to as much support as possible from the Liberal Democrats and indeed from all members of this House in making this case to people. We have to go out and make this case, as I think happened in the 50s when we built GRID. Because if we don't make this case, we leave ourselves exposed as a country. and It's the British people who pay the price. And I completely concur with her on rooftop solar. Clive Betts. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Could I welcome my right hon. Friend back to his position on the front bench? Uh, I particularly welcome the reference to hydrogen. I know he's been to visit ITM Power in my constituency. In particular, could I ask him about SMRs? When an announcement is going to be made uh, about the chosen two technologies to pursue with SMRs, and will he give an assurance whichever firms are picked, they will have to ensure that a very high percentage of the SMRs built are built in this country by UK firms like Forge Masters in my constituency, creating well-paid jobs as well as clean energy. Well, I would definitely concur with him on what he says, first of all, about uh, ITM Power, a uh, company that I have 
visited an incredibly <laughs> impressive uh, uh, company too. And I would also concur with him on the SMR uh, program. Our manifesto was clear that we support uh, new nuclear, including Sizewell, uh, and we also support the SMR program. Part of our challenge is to examine the legacy left to us by the last government, but I, he should be in no doubt about my absolute, my absolute support for the SMR program, and it is important, and we will be absolutely striving to do this to keep to the timetable set out. Jane Harriet Baldwin. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. And uh, in welcoming the Secretary of State to his role, and he was quite political in his reply, and I will gently point out that in West Worcestershire, fewer people voted Labour at this election than in the last election or the one before. And I wonder whether he's ever visited the beautiful landscapes of West Worcestershire. And uh, the Malvern Hills and Breeden Hill are some of the most treasured landscapes in our land. What parameters is he going to put on uh, the building of pylons, wind farms and solar farms across that beautiful landscape? Well, I thank the Honourable Lady for the uh, question. Um, as with any planning decisions, there are clear parameters in the legislation uh, about the consultation that needs to take place with local communities. But look, I do gently point this out to her. Nine years ago, the last government banned onshore wind in England because for some of the reasons that she set out. Now, I thought that was a mistake at the time. It turned out to be even more of a mistake than even I thought because it just exposed us to energy insecurity. And so we have to make judgments as members of this House, which is given the scale of the climate crisis we face, given the scale of the energy insecurity we, we have and the sec energy security threat we face, do we believe we need to build infrastructure? Now, I happen to believe we do. Yes, with community consent. Yes, with community benefit. Yes, with the planning rules that I've set out. Uh, Martin McCluskey. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, I congratulate the Secretary of State for his new position. The Secretary of State was lucky enough um, to visit my constituency during the election campaign and visit the port of Greenock. And there he saw the great potential that exists in Inverclyde and Renfrewshire West for us to contribute to the government's clean energy mission. And what plans does he have to ensure that every part of the country, including in Scotland, can make a contribution? And what message would he have for my constituents who are looking to the government to make investment in our ports and our marine assets? Well, I thank my honourable friend for that question. He is an incredibly eloquent advocate for his port, um, and uh, I, I, was a, I was delighted to visit uh, during the election. I think he makes such an important point, which is, as an island nation looking to take advantage in jobs as well as generation of the opportunities of offshore wind, including, including floating offshore wind, our ports are a massively undervalued and underinvested asset. That's why we set out in our uh, manifesto the largest uh, investment in ports, public investment in ports uh, since privatisation. And, and he's absolutely right to say this must involve uh, all of our uh, United Kingdom. And obviously, Scotland plays a special place uh, in this uh, as the uh, new headquarters, as it will become the new headquarters of GB Energy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. In the previous Parliament, I was lucky enough to be co chair of the APPG for Deep Geothermal, and I felt we'd made some good progress in uh, missing the government of the merit that has in helping with the, the climate change transition. Uh, will the new Secretary of State commit to meeting with the REA, who is Secretary up for the APPG, and myself to see what more we can do to convince the new government of the role Deep Geothermal can play? Yeah. Well, look, in the spirit that I talked about in my statement, can I congratulate the Honourable Gentleman? Um, on his work on deep geothermal, because it was an outstanding example of the way that members of parliament can advance uh, the role that particular technologies can play. He's a most eloquent advocate for this technology. I had the chance during the uh, election uh, campaign in the m many places I went to, uh, to, to see deep geothermal uh, in Cornwall, uh, which also has, a potential, uh, also has the potential for lithium, uh, mining as well, so a source of uh, critical uh, minerals. Uh, between our, myself and the um, new Minister for Energy, who's going to be a very busy man, we will make sure that we meet him and his uh, uh, colleagues to take forward this agenda. In line with the Cornwall thread, Jane Kirkham. <coughs> Thank you, Madam 
Mr. Speaker. Cornish ports like Falmouth, which the Secretary of State visited during the campaign, have well advanced plans to reconfigure to service floating offshore wind in the Celtic Sea, and Cornish FE providers are keen to gear up to provide specialised courses to support speedy growth of that industry so young people in Cornwall have the opportunity to train for those high skilled jobs of the future. But they've struggled in the past due to lack of government support. Could the Secretary of State please confirm that support will be available to ports, businesses and educational establishments in Cornwall to enable them to plug into the vast opportunities opened up by floating offshore wind in the Celtic Sea? Well, 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 can I congratulate my uh, honourable friend uh, on her election? Can I say she is a great person to go out on a boat with? Uh, and I, 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 I very much enjoyed um, our, our talk. She, she makes uh, such an important point about the Celtic Sea and about the opportunity we have. And you know, one of the decisions on my desk will be how we make sure we advance floating wind technology and make sure that we manufacture in the UK. As Tim Pick, the offshore wind champion, often uh, reminds me that the largest floating wind prototype is off the coast of Scotland, but it's not manufactured in the UK. We need to change that. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Labour Manifesto stated that building new nuclear power and small modular reactors will be important in developing new clean power. Yet there was not a single mention yesterday in the King's speech about nuclear power. Can the Secretary of State assure me that developing new nuclear power is still a priority of this government? And what are the specific plans for the Wilva and Strauss-Vinney sites in Wales? Here, here. Well, can I th- uh, also welcome the Honourable Lady uh, uh, to, her, to her place. Uh, let me just say to her that Great British Energy will, of course, have a strong interest uh, in nuclear power, um, working with Great British Nuclear, a very, very important for the future. Uh, this government was very, very clear in its manifesto about the role that <coughs> nuclear power can play, both large-scale nuclear and SMRs. Uh, and I know that the last government purchased the, the site for um, uh, Wilver, and it's something we will be uh, certainly looking at. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. May I congratulate my right honourable friend to his place and congratulate him for his ambition. Bio Yorkshire is a project, a Green New Deal, to create 4,000 green collar jobs, upskill 25,000 workers, as well as create hundreds of spin offs and new start companies focused on chemicals, agriculture, and a new generation of fuels. Will he ensure that his department have early engagement with this Green New Deal for York and North Yorkshire and ensure that that is part of his energy superpower for the future? Secretary of State. Well, I- I'm grateful to my honourable friend for drawing this project to my attention. I think, in a way, the, the questions from both sides of the House are demonstrating the huge <laughs> potential that we have in this area. Uh, not just to tackle the climate crisis, not just to tackle energy and security, but to create the good jobs of the future. And uh, I, I certainly undertake that in our department we will want to look closely at her project. Dr Andrew Morrison. What assessment has the new Secretary of State made of proposals to build an interconnector between Morocco and the UK, bringing clean solar and wind energy that could potentially provide 8% of the UK's grid requirements? Well, look, I thank the uh, Honourable Gentleman for this question. It's certainly a project I took an interest in uh, in opposition. I, indeed, I met with x uh, the company uh, involved in this. I need to be careful what I say on these uh, matters, as he will uh, appreciate, but it's certainly uh, a project that my department will want to consider. Afsal Khan. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I thank the Secretary of State for his statement. He has already showed more ambition and leadership in transitioning away from dirty energy in his 14 days in government than the Tories did in 14 years. Does the Secretary of State agree that by making the UK a clean energy superpower, we will also be able to tackle air pollution, which kills over 100 people in a year, Manchester alone? Uh, well, look, can, can, I, uh, can I thank my honourable friend for that question? That's the kind of question I like. Uh, 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 um, uh, I, th- I think he makes a very serious and important point about air pollution and uh, w- w- another reason why we need to move away from fossil fuels. And in a sense, 
The tragedy around air pollution is that this is a silent killer. Thousands of people, tens of thousands of people a year, are, are killed, die prematurely in our country as a result of air pollution. If it was any other issue, people would be out on the streets, but because it is a silent killer, it, is, it sort of goes too little noticed. He is absolutely right. This is yet another reason why it's important we act with speed and we transition as fast as we can. Kit Morthouse. Thank you, Madam Deputy uh, Speaker. Just before I ask my question, for the Secretary of State's own protection, it might be helpful. I'm, I'm conscious we don't have a register of interest at the moment. If you could just tell the House whether he's accepted any uh, donations or otherwise during the campaign that might be declarable. I just want to press him further on, on protection of the landscape. In my constituency, 80% of which is an area of outstanding natural beauty, now rebranded as a national landscape, I just wanted to uh, get his reassurance that in the planning decisions that are made by him and his honourable friend, the Secretary of State at uh, DLUC, that they will respect the notion of protected landscape. I have a series of solar farm applications in my constituency, some of which are either in or impinge upon the area of outstanding natural beauty, and it's very important that I mean, that landscape is protected for a reason that the government respects those protections in, the, in planning law, and I hope he'll confirm that that will be the case. The well, his first question, I'm, I'm proud to have been supported by the GMB uh, union and Osdor during the election. I think it's, it's below the declarable limit, but I'm very happy to uh, put that on record uh, to the uh, uh, honourable uh, gentleman. Uh, on his question, look, we want to look carefully at these planning uh, issues, and you know, I, I just want to sort of underline this point. I understand as a constituency MP the concerns of local people on these planning issues. And you know, we have to take those concerns seriously. Not all planning applications are good applications, uh, and that is not the position uh, of this government. At the same time, I think it is widely recognised, in particular if you take what the National Infrastructure Commission has said, that the way the planning process uh, has worked has delayed the clean energy we need, uh, and it has made us poorer as a country, and this government is determined to change that. Uh, Brian Lishman. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Secretary of State for the constructive manner that he and the government have approached the vitally important issue of the Grangemouth refinery, which is so crucial to life in my constituency? Can the Secretary of State confirm that the UK government will be tenacious and resolute in seeking an industrial future for the Grangeway site, and will he agree to meet with me to discuss potential options for its future? Yeah. Well, State. well, can I pay tribute to my uh, honourable friend for sort of very early on in his time as a Member of Parliament being such an eloquent advocate uh, around uh, Grangemouth. Uh, he, he, you know, his counsel, his advice, his, his, his work on this has been very uh, important. In the last two weeks, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I've had three conversations with my counterpart in the Scottish Government. Uh, this is a sign of the way we intend to go on, which we, we will work across party, across government, to do all we can. The future of Grangemouth really, really matters uh, to this government. Uh, we will leave no stone unturned in working with the unions, uh, the companies concerned, uh, the Scottish Government, in doing everything we can to secure a viable future uh, for uh, activity on that site and, indeed, for the communities of Grangemouth. Pete Wishart. After the King's speech and this statement, we still haven't got a clue what this GB energy is going to look like. And they can't even tell us where it's going to be placed other than within the 30,000 square miles of Scotland. But Greg Jackson, the boss of Octopus, had said that if we reform this absurd energy market into some sort of regional pricing structure, everybody in the UK would have cheaper bills and Scotland would have the cheapest energy in the whole of Europe. Will he now look at that and ensure that he delivers that prospect for everybody across the well, I'm slightly disappointed, but not surprised by the uh, honourable gentleman's uh, uh, the honourable gentleman's tone. I would have thought that the Scottish National Party uh, would welcome, certainly, actually, my counterpart in the Scottish Government did welcome it, uh, uh, a publicly owned energy generation company located in Scotland. And, and let's be absolutely clear about this: this will be a generator of energy. If we think about, if we think about countries, if we think about companies like Allstead, like Statcraft, that is what they do. And they own, and they, and they own power in this country, uh, and we will, do the, we will do the same. Look, on the wider, on the wider question uh, that he asks, these are, these are complex questions. Look, we, definite, we definitely need fairness across the United Kingdom when it comes to energy prices, and that's what this government will endeavour to deliver. Nadia Whittam. 
Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I congratulate my right honourable friend on his appointment and welcome him back to government. Madam Deputy Speaker, my constituents and indeed all of our constituents have suffered the worst cost of living crisis in generations, thanks to the party opposite being enthralled to fossil fuel interests and failing to invest in renewables. Does the Secretary of State agree with me that we need a publicly owned domestic energy champion that can speed up our transition to green energy, reduce our reliance on volatile international gas markets, and cut household bills at the same time? Yeah. Secretary of State. I, I, I thank my honourable friend for that question, and, and she has been an incredibly ed eloquent advocate on these issues, including in the last parliament. I do think, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is an important point for all parties in this House to reckon with. And this is, this is different from what I would have said 15 years ago uh, when I was in my place as Energy Secretary. The energy insecurity case for action on clean energy is totally transformed in the last 15 years. Why? In part because of you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine reminds us what exposure can look like, but also because over the last decade we've seen a 90% fall in the costs of solar and a 70% fall in the costs of offshore wind. So the old argument, which is that in the long term it will save us money, but in the short term it, cost, it, it might cost more, has changed. This is the cheapest, cleanest form of energy we can access. Timothy. Thank you. In West Suffolk, the Seneca application received 1,360 submissions from interested parties against it, and the technical report that recommended against was 339 pages long. Has the Secretary of State visited the Seneca site, and how many hours did it take him to read all the submissions and evidence and make his own detailed technical and legal judgments to overrule them? Yeah. Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman that anyone who knows me knows me as a, uh, a super nerd? Uh, and, uh, and that means that when it comes to all of my responsibilities, particularly my quasi-judicial responsibilities, I take them incredibly seriously, and I did in all the judgments I made. Alistair Stratton. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Secretary of State, and I think honourable friends are going to find it nice getting you to say Secretary of State yeah, yeah. this statement today. The last actions over the last few weeks, I think, really underline how damaging the inaction of the last 14 years have been. Mm. Yep. And the CCC report out today really confirmed, I think, for me, yeah. the true extent of the Tories' climate denialism and the way in which that has undermined our ability to deliver on so many important aspects of this agenda. Yeah. Would the Secretary of State agree, oh, though, that no less damaging is the climate delivery denialism that we're seeing parts of this House now starting to fall back on. And can he confirm that this government won't shy away from some of the tough choices that are going to be have to made to deliver not just on the climate agenda that voters have supported, but the energy security we desperately need? Secretary well, look, I thank my uh, honourable friend uh, for that uh, sort of really, really important uh, question that he asked. And, and it, is, it is sort of worth underlining this fact that he draws attention to in the Climate Change Committee report, which is we have an internationally set a nationally determined contribution of 68 per cent reductions uh, by 2030 on 1990 levels, and the Climate Change Committee says this morning uh, that only a third of the emissions reductions required are covered by credible plans. That is the legacy that we have been left. Now, I am determined that we meet uh, those, those plans, but that's why we've got to speed up uh, and, and, and act in a way the, government, uh, the last government didn't act. On his point about clean energy, he is right about this. I mean, this is, this is why I said earlier, this is a debate this country is going to have to have. We can say no to clean energy. We can say no to building grids. But that will leave us poorer, it will leave us more exposed, and it will mean that we are not doing what is required to tackle the climate crisis. Now, this government has made its choice. Others will have to do so too. Leila Moran. Madam Deputy Speaker, may I welcome the Secretary of State to his post, but also the tone of that statement, which ambition I share. But would he join me in commending the ambitious work of Lib Dem-led Oxfordshire County Council, who want to reach net zero by 2030, but also to commend the work of all councils everywhere. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. are on the front line of the climate yeah, yeah. crisis in our communities. He talks about local people having a say. Does he agree with me that often the best way for local communities that fe to feel they have that say is through our local councils? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. State. I think the Honourable Lady has a, makes a very uh, important, characteristically so, a very important point on this, which is we have to get the central local relationship right 
when it comes to delivering this agenda. Because if, it, if we try and deliver it all from the centre, we will not succeed. If we take an example like the appalling state of energy efficiency in our homes, uh, that is something where so much of it is going to have to be delivered by local authorities. Uh, that is the right way uh, to, to do it. And I pay tribute, frankly, to all of the local authorities across the country who are showing ambition in this area. Rachel Blake. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and congratulations to the new Secretary of State. Uh, the cities of London and Westminster has a huge contribution to make for the UK to be a clean energy superpower, not just in the investment driven from the City of London and the innovation driven by the businesses across the constituency, but in our residential community energy schemes. Uh, Aldgate Community Energy is a fantastic local cooperative, but I want to ask you about the Pimlico District Heating Undertaking, which after years of dither and delay from a Conservative government and the former Conservative Council is in desperate need of investment. Will the Secretary of State meet with me to discuss how we can make this an exemplar scheme and mitigate the costs for local residents, local leaseholders, who may be facing significantly high costs due to the nature and construction of the piece of equipment? Thank you. Yeah. I thank my Honourable Friend for that question. I congratulate her uh, on her election. I've worked with her in the past and, and know she'll be an outstanding member. Uh, of, of Parliament. I think my honourable friend, the Minister for Energy, is going to be very busy, uh, but he will, I'm sure, happily meet with her uh, on, on, the, on the question she raises. But she does raise an, a, a, a point which I want to, to emphasise, which is one of the things that Great British Energy will be doing is our local power plan, which is absolutely working with local communities in order to deliver community energy, working with local authorities, working with local communities, because one of the answers to the question of how we build public consent for this is actually community ownership of energy. And we want to see as we want absolute drive forward in that, and that's what the local power plan will do. Sir Gavin Williamson. Uh, I'd like to start off by congratulating the right honourable gentleman on the appointment to his post. Uh, the decisions that the government has made will see a much more rapid decommissioning of oil and gas in the North Sea. How much additional money has he secured from the Treasury to cover the government's legal costs for that decommissioning, and how much does he think it will t t uh, cost in total? Well, look, what I'll say to the uh, honourable gentleman is the most important thing here is what we have secured in our manifesto to build a just uh, transition for those communities. Uh, £8.3 billion through Great British uh, Energy, over £7 billion through our National Wealth Fund. The, the truth is that there is massive debate in this House about licensing. He will, he will not have been at the debate when we discussed these issues. The difference it makes in terms of how much of our gas demand is, is produced domestically is that on the old government, let me explain, on the old government policy, there would have been a 95% reduction in our, in our demand met domestically. Under this government's policy, it will be 97%. So for all the hue and cry from the party opposite, that is the reality. Perrin Moon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to welcome the Secretary of State to his position. <coughs> Cornwall is one of the most deprived areas of Northern Europe. However, we are blessed with vast renewable energy resources. It's been mentioned earlier. Onshore wind, offshore wind, geothermal, tidal, solar, ground horse, uh, source heat technologies. And yes, Madam Deputy Speaker, critical minerals, not from China, but from Camborne and Redruth. Will the Secretary of State meet with me and other Cornish colleagues to discuss how GB Energy will be used to realise our renewable energy potential to transform local Cornish economies. Well, let me say, he's also a great guy to go on a boat with, uh, <laughs> Madam, uh, Madam Deputy uh, uh, Speaker. I think he makes a very important point. He makes a very important point about Cornwall and the incredibly important role that Cornwall can play, but also about our coastal communities. Some of the biggest economic challenges we face as a country are in our coastal communities. If we get this right, and it's not easy, but if we get this right, this can be a massive opportunity, not just for Cornwall, but for all of our coastal communities, and that's what this government intends to do. Jim Shannon. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. You just caught me off guard there. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm so used to being the last boy in the house, but there you are. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, can I, uh, first of all, welcome the Secretary of State to his place? I know it's always been his ambition to have the opportunity. You now have that, and I hope it goes well for you, and we support you in what you try to achieve. With this new government comes a new way of achieving goals and aims. I represent Strangford uh, as a mostly a rural constituency where farming is a way of life, a key part of the economy, creates thousands of jobs uh, and opportunity. Therefore, it is also key for the future for us, and, and obviously green energy and net zero is important to that as well. So, Can the Secretary of State confirm that the farming community and agri-food needs will be paramount in any effort to achieve a better world for all of us to live in? Thank you. Well, can I thank the uh, honourable gentleman for his kind words? I've, I've sometimes said to people in the last few days, Madam Deputy Speaker, that I feel I'm uh, going back to do a job I did 15 years ago, and you get to try and do it better now. I'm sure they would agree, probably, uh, 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 with that. But it is a, it, I do feel it is a, a, an amazing uh, opportunity and a big, obviously, responsibility. I think the honourable gentleman makes an important point about the role of rural communities and the role of far farming communities in particular. And we are determined to get this balance right between food security, nature preservation, and uh, clean energy. And the truth is that we haven't thought about the role of our land enough as a country in recent years. And that's what we hope will be driven by this land use framework that my right on friend, Secretary of State for DEFRA, will produce. Melanie on. Welcome the Secretary of State and his team to their place. Now, he will know that my constituency of Great Grimsby and Cleethorpes has benefited hugely from offshore wind, uh, particularly in operations and maintenance. But what has failed to be produced is the absolutely critical part of the supply chain. So, what does he uh, suggest that we can all do across all parts of the House to make sure that we get the supply chain absolutely right so that constituents in Great Grimsby and Cleethorpes can benefit from that investment? Well, can I welcome our honourable friend back to this house? Uh, it's fantastic to see her back in her place, and also c congratulate her as somebody who knows so much about this subject, including with, in her work uh, wh when she was outside this uh, uh, house for working for Renewable uh, UK. So, I think she makes such an important point here, which is that the right on the lady opposite draws attention to our generation of offshore wind, and indeed we have done well in the generation of offshore wind. But I think it is commonly accepted that we have not done nearly so well in generating the jobs that should come with offshore wind. And part of what I'll be doing with my right honourable friend, the business secretary, is developing a proper green industrial strategy, including in the supply chain. So we have, a, we have clarity about what the plan is to make sure that we don't just have the energy generation, but we have the jobs generation too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Carla Danya. I welcome the Secretary of State to his role and welcome the Government's recognition that public investment must play a substantial role in decarbonising power. I have seen this from my previous career in offshore wind. This public investment must not be only about de-risking private sector investment, though, as some of his colleagues have implied would be the principal role of Great British Energy. So, Can the Secretary of State confirm that Great British Energy will be investing in fully or at least majority publicly owned renewable generation projects <coughs> and not confining itself to taking minority stakes in private sector led projects that would give it very little control. Secretary can, can, I, can I welcome the uh, honourable lady to her place and can I confirm that GB Energy will play a role in all kinds of ways and we're certainly not restricting it uh, in the way uh, that, that, uh, that she suggested. C can I also say to her that in the constructive spirit of these exchanges, I would ask that the Green Party thinks about its commitment to tackling the climate crisis, which we all share, and then thinks about this question of infrastructure. Because if it wants to tackle the climate crisis, but at the same time leading members of the Green Party are saying no to new energy infrastructure, that simply doesn't add up. Uh, Torsten Bell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I also welcome the Secretary of State uh, to his place. It's very appropriate that he's bringing the level of energy he is uh, to this, and we all hope to see much more of that in the years ahead. It's also a big c contrast to the previous 10 years of inaction, which has cost us not just in terms of our energy security, but in terms of wasted opportunities. And I'd like to touch on one of those, which is the huge tidal power potential that Britain has that's available in Swansea, not just in Sefton. So, the, um, so does he agree it's time to seize that opportunity rather than waste it? 
Secretary of State. Uh, can I welcome my honourable friend for, uh, to his place? And if uh, you will allow me briefly, the honourable gentleman was the head of policy for me when I was uh, leader of the opposition. And it's a particular pleasure. I tended to do what he told me rather than the other way around. But anyway, uh, it is a particular pleasure uh, to, to see him uh, in, his, in his place. He makes such an important point. Tidal is, a, is an area where Britain is in the lead, but we want to go further and faster, and it has huge potential for our country. Robbie Moore. Madam Deputy Speaker, I welcome the Secretary of State uh, to his place, but I have to say the government's disastrous decision already taken to industrialise our highly productive, good agricultural land by approving three huge solar farms clearly demonstrates the government's unwillingness to listen to local communities' concerns, run roughshod over rural communities and their ability to have their say, but it's also hugely detrimental to food security. So given his decision, can the Secretary of State explain to the House how he will look the farming community in the eye and uh, explain his decision, but also the government's lukewarm words on this food security being national security. Yeah. 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 I, I'm afraid we have to start. We have to conduct these debates on the on the basis of facts, not myth. percent of our land and around that number for agricultural land is being used for solar panels. We cannot proceed. We cannot, we cannot proceed on the basis of myth. And he talks about the farming community. Farmers want this. It's a, the National Farmers Union has, has supported this, uh, Madam, Madam Deputy Speaker. Of course we will work with local communities. But every time a member opposite gets up and opposes clean energy. They are saying to the British people, we are going to make you poorer, we are going to make us more energy insecure, and we are not going to tackle the climate crisis. Imran Hussain. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, can I thank the Secretary of State for setting out his very clear uh, strategy? Uh, can he confirm that projects such as the new hydrogen hub in Bradford will be at the forefront of that strategy? And Will he guarantee proper investment into places like Bradford so we can grow and become a global leader in this sector as well as generate well-paid and sustainable jobs? Well, I really welcome my honourable friend's uh, advocacy on this issue. The hydrogen economy is a really, really important part of our future. It's yet another uh, example uh, of where we can succeed as a country, generate those good jobs at good wages, and I look forward to engaging with him on these issues. Alistair Carmichael. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I take the Secretary of State back to the question of tidal power generation? If he speaks to the developers in that sector at the moment, they will tell him that they need two things to keep growing that sector. They need an expanded pot for the ring fence allocation in the next allocation round, and they need also an ambitious deployment target for the sector. So can we have an early announcement in respect of that? And if he really wants to understand the potential of marine uh, renewables, he needs to get himself up to the European yeah, yeah. Marine Energy yeah, Centre yeah. In, in Orkney. Yeah, He'll yeah. be very welcome any time, but he might want to come in the summer while the days are still long. <laughs> well, look, I, will, um, I'll, I thank him for that uh, invitation, and uh, I will uh, uh, consider it uh, strongly, um, uh, because uh, I, I care a lot about this, uh, this area. Look, I obviously have to make decisions in a certain capacity around AR6, uh, but I've heard what he said. Blair McDougall. Can I welcome the Secretary of State and his excellent team uh, to their new roles, and can I look forward to welcoming, welcoming them back to Whiteley's wind farm, where I know he's been many times before, to see how the largest wind farm onshore in the UK is not only contributing to energy but to uh, the community and its, uh, its, its life. Um, can I declare an interest as the outgoing chair of the Uyghur campaign um, in the UK? The Secretary of State will be aware that much of the polysilicon used um, within solar manufacturing is sourced from within the Uyghur region, where Uyghurs and other Turkic Muslims are routinely used as slave uh, labourers. The expansion of solar that he is uh, envisioning 
gives us enormous economic leverage in the UK, and I wonder how he intends to use that leverage to get that industry to clean up its supply chains and seek alternative sources of polysilicate. Well, well, let me welcome my, the my friend to his place. And he raises a very important issue. There were some standards put in place by the last government, but I think we should take this issue incredibly seriously. Uh, and I look forward to discussions uh, with him on these issues. Lee Anderson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Now, the Secretary of State speaks very passionately about GB Energy. I'd just like to remind him that just a few years ago, in Nottingham, the Labour-controlled Nottingham City Council had their own energy company called Robin Hood Energy. But this was Robin Hood with a modern twist. It robbed from the poor and gave to the rich and cost the taxpayer about £50 million. So from that dispatch box, can the Secretary of State please tell the House how much GB Energy is going to cost the taxpayer? Secretary of State. Uh, well, look, first of all, if I can explain to the uh, honourable gentleman, Robin Hood Energy was a supply company. This is a generation company. So, that, so Robin, Hood was a, Robin Hood was a retailer, so, so, it's, so it's different. I have to say I am surprised about the position he takes. I thought the position of his party was to be in favour of publicly owned energy. I think they produced lots of videos on social media to that effect. Adam Joggy. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Speaker. Uh, the Secretary of State knows how important energy security is for people of Newcastle and Lyme from his recent visit. I'm just sorry there was no vote. Uh, but after 14 years of the Tories, uh, they saw, we saw uh, bills pushed up for families and we were left at the mercy of Putin. Uh, after his invasion of Ukraine. So can I urge the Secretary of State to build on his excellent return to the job, the comeback kid, uh, and get to work quickly uh, so we can cut bills and give my constituents the energy security they deserve? Well, I think to be called a kid at my time of life is uh, uh, stretching things uh, a bit, but I'm nevertheless uh, grateful for his uh, contribution. Look, I think he makes such an important point about right across our country, the opportunities here are huge. And if we look at what something like the Inflation Reduction Act has done in the United States, it has seized those opportunities. And we are a smaller economy than the US economy, but we intend to seize those, economy, uh, those opportunities too with a proper modern industrial policy. Sarah Dyke. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the Secretary of uh, State to his place. Uh, Somerset is home to many ground-mounted uh, solar farm developments, and while I fully support the uh, significantly increasing the amount of electricity we generate from renewables, I believe that communities that host the infrastructure, such as this, should receive compensation. Your Government's uh, recent policy statement of onshore wind agreed with this. So may, may I ask if community benefit funds will be mandated for new solar farm developments. Secretary of State. I think the Honourable Lady raises a really important issue. The last government had a whole series of consultations out on community benefit. We will respond to those. But look, I, I want to be very clear uh, today that I believe that when a community takes on the responsibility of hosting clean energy infrastructure, it should benefit from it. Annalise Mitchell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to welcome my right honourable friends to his role and welcome his ambition. During the general election campaign, so many residents in Nosley told me that they were struggling with the cost of, en of um, living crisis and rising energy bills. Can the Secretary of State confirm that Great British Energy will allow us to take back control of our system, give us energy, energy security and, crucially, lower bills for families? Well, let me welcome my uh, honourable friend uh, to her place and congratulate her uh, on her election. She, she will be a, a great member uh, of Parliament. I think she raises such an important issue, and I just want to particularly raise, mention the issue of fuel poverty. More than three million people, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, in fuel poverty in our country. Now, one thing that this government is going to do, which the last government didn't, which will already make a dent in that, is demand that by 2030 landlords raise the standard of their accommodation uh, to a proper uh, standard EPCC. That will make a dent in this, but the House should be under no doubt about my ambition. Our ambition is to cut that number of 3.2 million as much as possible in the five years of this Parliament. James Wilde. Thank you, Madam yeah, Deputy yeah. Speaker. Plans for 90 miles of pylons from Lincolnshire to my northwest Norfolk constituency and new substations are strongly opposed by local communities. So will the right honourable gentleman commit to a review of network technologies and consider a presumption in favour of underground or offshore proposals? 
Uh, Madam Speaker, I'll look at all proposals, but I think the honourable gentleman knows, and this is why the last government didn't agree with this, uh, that it costs six to ten times more to underground cables. And if, and if part of our challenge, if part of our challenge is to cut bills for people, this is not a sustainable solution for the future. And look, I, I, I'm sympathetic to all constituency MPs who raise, raise issues on behalf of their constituents. But I will say again, gently to the honourable gentleman. If we want to avoid a repeat of the cost of living crisis, if we want to tackle the climate crisis, if we want energy security, we will have to build the grid in our country. Henry Tufnell. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I welcome the Secretary of State's comments today, which are incredibly encouraging for communities like mine in West Wales? Throughout the campaign, I heard again and again the demand from local people from Pembroke Dock to Milford Haven for well-paying, secure jobs in the industries of the future. With the port of Milford Haven, we have a huge opportunity, particularly in the area of floating offshore wind. Would the Secretary of State meet with me to discuss the opportunities for my constituency and how we can overcome the barriers to investment in local jobs? Can I thank my honourable friend for that question? I was delighted to uh, visit the port of Milford Haven, dr Haven during the uh, election campaign. I think what, look, there's an interesting issue here, which is the investment that this government is making, 1.8 billion in our ports, will hopefully allow us to invest in more ports uh, for, for the purposes of floating offshore wind than the last government was able to. I'm not, I can't from this dispatch box make promises uh, about particular ports, but I think it's so important this, because if we are to get the jobs here, we must invest in our port infrastructure. Greg Smith. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Secretary of State has referred multiple times in his remarks this afternoon about community consent, yeah. yet the 6,000 acres of solar installations, such as that in my honourable friend for West Suffolk's constituency, had no such community consent. And that sends shivers down the spine of my constituents in around the villages known as the Claydens, who are looking down the barrel of a 2,100-acre solar installation called Rosefield, on top of a battery storage plant yeah. next door, on top of the tail wagging the dog of National Grid wanting to build a brand new substation to take the thing yeah. in. What's actually going to change to make community consent a reality? Secretary well, look, State. what the, what the uh, honourable gentleman wants for nationally significant projects is community veto. And I'll be honest with him, I'm, he nods his head, we're not going to give community veto. The last government didn't give it either. There are nationally significant projects that we as a government have to make decisions on. Now, obviously, we have to take into account the views of local communities, but the whole point of the nationally significant infrastructure uh, programme of uh, decision making is that we look at the needs of the nation as well. That's why, in my view, community benefit is important because if we ask local communities to host clean energy infrastructure, sometimes they won't, they won't want it, sometimes a minority won't want it, I'm not presuming in this case, then we should make sure that those communities benefit from it. Andrew Pates. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to welcome the Secretary of State and his team to the, uh, to the Chamber. It's a privilege to make my first contribution in this House on such an ambitious plan. It's not just ambitious because of net zero and the climate crisis and about energy security, but also about jobs and opportunities for young people in places like mine. In my constituency, Peterborough College is already building a green technology centre to develop new green apprenticeships, and we have plans for a clean energy transition centre. So can I ask the Secretary of State, would you put on record your commitment to work with trade unions, communities, colleges and others, so that we can move from blue collar to green collar apprenticeships and give young people a give young people an opportunity to succeed in life as we meet our climate and energy needs. Secretary State. Can I welcome my honourable friend to his place? I think he raises a very, very important question, Madam Deputy Speaker, which is how we make sure, and this will be a, an issue familiar, I think, to members across the House, how we make sure not just that we have the capacity to generate the jobs in clean energy, but also we can meet the skills needs of the country uh, in, in actually filling those jobs. And this is frankly something where we need to do a lot better as a country. My department, I'll be talking about this in the next few weeks, my department will, have, will, will be taking on a, a more of a sort of function around looking at what the skills needs of the clean energy economy are, working with the Department for Education on how we meet them. And, and my honourable friend raises a, a crucial point in that context. Tony Bourne. 
Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, can I congratulate the Secretary of State and his team on their recent appointment and also thank them for their recent visit to Chain Court Wind Farm, uh, a wind farm in my constituency of Folkestone and Hyde, which uh, uh, was opened by the Secretary of State in 2009. Uh, Dungeness A and B in my constituency are former nuclear uh, power stations which are in the process of being decommissioned. Dungeness has the land, the infrastructure, the grid connections, the local expertise which make it well placed for new nuclear. So would the Secretary of State be willing to meet with me uh, to discuss how we can harness Dungeness's potential for the local area and the local uh, regional community? Secretary of State. Well, can I say I was delighted to um, go to visit the um, uh, visit with my honourable friend to the Cheney Court Wind Farm, a wind farm I first uh, opened 15 years ago uh, on my first visit. Uh, as the uh, Secretary of State, p pictures of how much I've aged are available on request um, uh, then and now. Um, but he, look, he raises a really important issue, which is he is an important advocate for clean energy, whether it is in relation to wind power or the potential nuclear programme. Both of them, Madam Deputy Speaker, are important to us. Richard Bergen. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And can I uh, congratulate the uh, Secretary of State? Uh, on taking his position and also congratulate him for the very vigorous start that he's made on this most important of issues uh, facing humanity uh, and facing uh, the world. I was particularly encouraged to see the Secretary of State put climate diplomacy high up on the agenda, making climate diplomacy something at the heart of the new cabinet. That's so important after 14 years of the previous governments denigrating Britain's role in the world on this most, most important issues of tackling climate change. So can the Secretary of State uh, further outline to the House the work he plans to make sure that unlike in the last 15 years, Britain will be a main player, which it needs to be, uh, in the, uh, the global cooperation in tackling the threat of climate change. Look, I'm very pleased that the Honourable Gentleman has asked me this question. The world wants to see British leadership, Madam Deputy Speaker, but British leadership starts at home with the power of example. Because if we don't at home show that we are acting, uh, then people say, well, you're telling us one thing abroad, but you're doing something different when it comes to your own domestic uh, situation. Uh, and then the other thing I would say to him is, look, the, the truth is that COP29 is in Azerbaijan and COP30, crucially in Brazil, are going to be very, very important moments. COP30 is when the world has to come to terms with how far off track we are from 1.5 degrees and put in our nationally determined contributions uh, for 2035. I look forward to Britain playing as much of a constructive role in these negotiations as we possibly can. Luke Meyer. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and can I welcome the Secretary of State uh, to his place. Uh, Teesside is perfectly positioned for the green jobs of the future, jobs in hydrogen, in clean power and in ports, as he knows from his recent visit to Teesport. Um, will he meet with me and colleagues uh, to ensure that we can bring jobs and investment uh, to Teesside? Thank you. I think my honourable friend, and I welcome to his place, makes such an important point about the role that Teesside uh, can play. Uh, I saw on a recent visit uh, how much potential uh, there is, and we look forward, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, to working with him on these issues. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to welcome my right honourable friend and his team to their place. Uh, my right honourable friend had the privilege of visiting the Basingstoke College of Technology during the election campaign to meet with some of the fantastic apprentices uh, and students at that college. In uh, further to the answer to the honourable member, uh, my honourable friend for Peterborough, could he commit to working with colleges like Beacot as he develops that plan for skills and training, uh, as, as we need uh, uh, many of them, hundreds of thousands of jobs, in order to deliver on our ambition of a clean energy superpower? Uh, well, can I thank my honourable friend for his contribution, and can I welcome him to the House? He brings a wealth of knowledge and experience uh, on these issues, and he may, I, I really enjoyed my visit to Basingstoke. And I think what really came home to me on that visit is the enthusiasm for young people for this agenda. You know, young people, not simply because they care about the climate crisis, but because they see this as a potential future for themselves. Uh, and their, their friends and, 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 and family, and I really look forward to working with colleges like his to make that a reality. 
Josh Flinton Glynn. Josh Flinton Glynn. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and uh, it's great to see the Honourable Member in his place after over a decade of leadership on this issue, um, talking about climate change and really making that difference. Um, if we are to be a clean energy superpower, we need to learn from good examples and best practice wherever it is. Um, and I think here in, in, in Calder Valley, Together Housing are a really good example of a housing association who are doing the best in terms of pu putting solar panels on roofs and really making, taking advantage of micro-generation. But I'm sure the honourable gentleman will agree with me that one of the problems that these kinds of projects have is the national grid not being up to scratch. And a key to being a clean energy superpower is getting the, a modern national grid. I wonder if he'll also agree to come and visit some of Together Housing's projects that keep bills down and put, put solar panels on, panels on roofs. I welcome my honourable friend to his uh, place, congratulate him on his election, and I can commend his housing association for what they are doing. He, he raises one of the biggest issues that the last government faced and indeed that this government faces. And the flip side of all the honourable members from the party opposite who said we don't want the grid built is what my honourable friend just said. I think maybe they should have a conversation uh, because I think you know, what he is saying is if we don't build the grid, we can't get the clean energy, we can't get bill, uh, cut bills for our constituents. I don't say this is easy. I don't want to pretend this is easy. Certainly the last government didn't find it easy. But we do have to decide. And, and you know, to govern is to choose. And you know, our choice is that we believe that this clean energy infrastructure needs to be built. Follow. Madam Deputy Speaker. Last week, Bracknell Forest Council uh, brought together a climate change summit to bring in local businesses, schools and, uh, and community organisations in my constituency to engage in discussions about how best to, to face the, the challenges of climate change. Will the Secretary of State, uh, does the Secretary of State agree with me that communities are uh, crying out to uh, take part, to be engaged in the clean energy transition? Again, I congratulate my honourable friend. I think he raises a very, very uh, important point, which we haven't touched on, which is the role of citizens in this change. Uh, my sense is, of course, there are specific planning issues that people will raise about their own communities. But I think the view of a lot of member, citizens in our country is, what can I do? What difference can I make? And I think that government needs to do a better job of answering this, not nanny statism, I reassure them, uh, but public information, public information about the difference that people uh, can make to this incredibly important cause. Uh, last but not least, Lawrence Turner. Speaker, and as a recent official of the GMB trade union, which has been mentioned in this debate, may I welcome the Secretary of State and his team and his officials to their place and say how welcome it is to have a change of government from the record of the last 14 years and the ducking and the delaying of the difficult decisions on issues from nuclear to gas storage um, and the exclusion of workers' voices from the decisions that affect the energy system for too long. In opposition, he established an energy transition working group to bring together trade unions and workers' voices at the heart of the energy plans. Can you confirm today that continuing that group in government will be an early priority for this new administration? Can I welcome the honourable gentleman uh, to this House and can I sort of thank him from me for the work we did together in opposition on all of these issues. And I, and I think he, and, and this is the final question, Madam Deputy Speaker, he ends on a really, really important point, which is this government has a completely different attitude about the role that trade unions can play in the future of our energy system. As we, and we're proud of it, Madam Deputy Speaker, because if we are to make the energy transition, including the transition in the North Sea, if we are to build a proper industrial policy for the future, we should do what every other self-respecting nation does and have trade unions at the heart of our policy-making and decision-making, and that is what this government will do. Uh, congratulations.
congratulations everybody on getting through that. I'm delighted that everybody has got up to make their question and for the Secretary of State for his responses. Um,